Okay, so the 18th entry to the MCU in chronological order takes us to Spider-Man Homecoming. Taking place two months after the events of Captain America Civil War, the story of this movie is as follows. Peter Parker has to balance his life as both a superhero and as a typical high school student, while all the while coming into conflict, coming into conflict with the villain known as the Vulture, played by Michael Keaton. So yeah, that's the overall story of Spider-Man Homecoming. This is not a complex movie by any means necessary. This is not a thought-provoking movie by any means necessary. This is just a fun Spider-Man movie that has thrilling action, that has thrilling action, good characters, and an overall fun and simple story. Is this movie uh, is now is is this is this one of the best Spider-Man movies ever made? No, it's not. Is this one of the best MCU movies? Ah, uh, no, not really. But it's a fun MCU movie. So I'm going to illustrate my positives and I'm going to illustrate my negatives to paint an overall clear picture on how I feel about Spider-Man Homecoming, the MCU version of Spider-Man. So let's kick it off first with the cast. So the cast of this movie is a lot of fun. I like Tom Holland's introduction in Captain America Civil War. I thought in the brief screen time that he was given as Peter Parker and as, and as Spider-Man, he had it down pat. Homecoming, we actually get a chance to see him expand more on that role and... I gotta say, Tom Holland is a good Peter Parker and he's a good Spider-Man. See, I like that we get a chance to see a different version of Peter Parker play out on the big screen because we never really got a chance to see the high school version of Peter Parker. Yeah, we got that a little bit with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, but 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 by the time we get to the end of those movies, Peter's already out of high school. This is different. This is Peter Parker in high school. This is Peter Parker as a high school student. This is Spider-Man, who is essentially a high school student masquerading as a superhero he thinks they they thinks that he has that because he has these powers that he's untouchable and that he's and that he's above everything when it's the exact opposite spider-man always works best as a small scale superhero taking down crimes that in or around you know queens and stuff like that and the movie pretty much shows us like what he does he's basically a a new york he's basically just a a kid he's just he's basically someone who's doing a lot of good but he has aspirations to do bigger things, mainly because he, you know, he he was in Civil War. He helped Tony Stark fight off Captain America. And this kind of gave him more, more or less an inflated ego that gets popped as the film goes along. Because Peter pretty much learns how to be more humble, learns humility, learns that, <clears throat> learns that, that lear he learns that he's not ready for the responsibilities of being an Avenger yet. And throughout the course of the movie, he slowly starts to realize that. And I thought Tom Holland did a really good job at portraying that aspect of the character of Peter Parker. I like seeing Peter Parker as this over anxious, per as this over anxious kid who just wants to get in the suit and just wants to do things as Spider-Man. But as the film goes along, you find out that he's getting into conflicts that are way over that that he's really not equipped to handle. And that, and the, and you have certain scenes where he needs to have help from Tony Stark's Iron Man. In order, and, and and Iron Man has to more or less has to act as more or less his uh, mentor figure and to tell him, hey, listen, you're not ready for something like this. You know, you you're not ready to handle these kind of responsibilities. You got to get your feet wet first. You got to be a neighborhood Spider-Man. You got to like be a ground level. And I like that. You know that that you know that harkens that you know that you know that uh, expands on the whole established mentorship of Civil War with with Stark discovering Peter Parker. We get more of that in this movie, and a lot of this. And I even know Downey Jr. is not in this movie a lot. He's in the movie enough. <clears throat> He's in the movie enough to create that uh, to create that father son dynamic that was laid down in Civil War and it's more expanded upon in this movie, and I like it. I think Tom Holland and RDJ have really good on-screen chemistry with one another. I actually, I'm, I'm one of the people who actually likes the dynamic of Iron Man, of Iron Man being the mentor to Spider-Man. I think it works, uh, because essentially Downey, because essentially Tony Stark is Peter's Uncle Ben, when you look at it. He's the one who has to pretty much shepherd him as a superhero. And you have Aunt May, who pretty much tries to sh shepherd the more human side of peter and i like how those two and i like how these two different things mesh with peter it works it really does work i don't and i like it a lot uh the supporting cast that around top that are, that surrounds tom holland they're also pretty good i already mentioned like i said robert Downey jr he's not in this movie a lot but he's in it enough where he's a where he is a changing force in peter's character arc so i like all that stuff the stuff with, with the, the, that stuff is really good really good you have John Favreau who play who returns as Happy Hogan. I like the fact that Happy Hogan essentially plays like an uncle to Peter. 
And I think a lot of their bantering is actually really, really funny. And I, and I just think John Favreau is a very funny is a very funny comedic actor, and he has a lot of quips and one liners that are absolutely that really got that really got me in terms of in terms of the that really got me. So that's good stuff. Um, you know, Peter's high school friends. I thought they were pretty good as well. You know, Ned Leeds, who is uh, Peter's best friend. I thought he was fine in the role. He's he's nothing really not, nothing groundbreaking, nothing annoying, but he was good. Uh, mm, excuse me. The actress who plays uh, Liz, Peter's love interest in this movie, she's okay. Uh, Liz, she's kind of bland. The only thing of interest that happens to her is when you get to the third act, but the mood doesn't really do much with it once that revelation happens. And Liz is a character. She really, she, she really isn't all that interesting. The same thing goes for Zendaya as Marcel Jones, who when you get to the end of the movie, it's revealed that she's that she's MJ. Uh, she's another one who is just there. But the movie kind of hints and teases that, you know, she's mean to Peter in a lot of aspects. But when you get to Far From Home, you find out why she's mean to Peter, because she actually has a crush on Peter. So it's kind of so she it's kind of like that typical like high school girl who likes a guy. So their natural instinct is to just, you know, make fun of them as a way to, like, hide the fact that they have a crush on you. And in that aspect, I thought Zendaya did fine. I think everyone overhyped, overpraised her role in this movie because she's not, because she wasn't anything groundbreaking. She was fine for what it was, for what she was given. And that's basically it. Zendaya's character is non-existent, to be honest with you. And then you have... Marissa Tomei returning as Aunt May. You know, I like I like the inclusion of her in Civil War, and I like her in this movie. I like I like I like some of the conversations she ha that she has with Peter, trying to be his try more or less trying to be like his like uh, his guiding light in a way. And I just like the scenes of just Peter, you know, talking with his aunt. I like I really like the scene of Aunt May, you know, trying to help Peter get ready for the uh, homecoming dance. That's a nice little scene. I like some of the scenes they have at the Chinese restaurant. I like I like this. I like how when Peter gets down on himself, she, he has Aunt May to comfort him. You know, it's good stuff. Marissa Tomei did a good job playing playing Aunt May. Of course, she gets better when you get to No Way Home. <clears throat> but it, as it turns of a found, as it turns of like the beginnings of it, I like what I saw in this movie. It was good stuff. <clears throat> and of course, you have Michael Keaton who plays the Vulture. I'm a huge fan of Michael Keaton. I love Michael Keaton. And to me, Adrian Toomes, the Vulture. Now, in the comics, there's nothing really all that interesting about Adrian Toomes. He's just this old guy who wants to be young again. There's nothing to him in, in terms of his in terms of the comic book counterpart. Now, in terms of the movie, I like what they did with Adrian Toomes in the movie. I like the fact that he's basically like this scrap. How he's basically like a, like a scrapyard junker, and it was and during the events and pretty much post the events of the first Avengers movie, he and his team got this big contract to pretty much do to pretty much do cleaning. Of course, this brings in damage. Of course, this brings in damage control, which gets established in this show, in this movie, and they pretty much take that away from Tombs and basically putting him near bankruptcy. And of course, this, of course, while while this happens, Tombs comes into the possession of the alien technology left behind by the by the Chitauri. So he and his crew pretty much modify these weapons and become and become black market arms dealers, <clears throat> as a way for Tombs to make money to provide for his family. Like Tombs' motivation. Toombs is not doing the things he does in a more in a villainous way. He's doing the things he's doing in order to make sure his family has a chance to have a good living, in order that his family survives. Everything with Toombs, every, Toombs' entire motivation surrounds the protection of his family, and I like that. That makes him a more that makes him a very relatable villain and a very human villain. And you're taking away that cheesy aspect of just this old guy who's trying to find the fountain of youth. And not only that, I like the and I and I really like the whole uh, design of the vulture costume in this movie. It's got a really cool, unique look. It, it it can sometimes come across as really scary and frightening. If you're watching this as a child, of course. Uh, <clears throat> if, if you're watching as, as an adult, it's like, oh, it's pretty cool. It's a nice little update to the vulture costume. Like I like how it, it's like it's like a, it's almost like a Iron Man vulturey type of thing. When it has the big wings, you got the vulture talons. Like it's it's a nice like modern take on the vulture outfit kind of giving it giving it giving it an intimidation factor and of course you got michael keaton who sells the shit out of this role and just and just gives tombs just a lot of good character and a lot of presence and a lot of menace uh some of eight some of the best scenes that peter has is when he's coming into conflict with tombs of course how, how could you not like the scene where tombs is driving peter and liz to the to the to the homecoming dance 
that scene, that, all that stuff is just rich with tent. All that stuff is just rich with intensity. It's subtle. It's edge of your seat. It's nail biting. Pretty much the moment Adrian Toomes introduces introduces himself to Peter when he, Peter goes to the house to pick up Liz, everything from that moment all the way to when he drops him off at the, at the homecoming dance, great stuff. That's where I think John Watts' direction is actually as is at his most strongest is when he's creating that tense atmosphere from the from the ride from the uh, from the ride home from the ride from the house all the way to the school. Great stuff and the conversations that Toom and Peter have in the car also really really good because you get the sense that you know like tombs is a villain but he's not a heartless person like he's given peter a chance to he's given peter a chance to walk away more more on the lines as as him saying thank you for saving his daughter's life earlier on in the movie uh because <clears throat> an incident takes place in washington dc where peter and his classmates get stuck in an elevator and nearly die and of course he he saves them and of course tombs is very appreciative very appreciative of that you know, Spider-Man in essence saved his daughter, so of course he's gonna he's gonna give him a freebie. Of course, he also makes a threat like, if you continue to muddle my business, I'm gonna take you down. I'm gonna take you down hard, and everyone around you is also gonna go down with you. So, I like that stuff. It gives it gives Toom so much menace. I love it a lot. And Keaton did a great job. And also, it was also nice to see Michael Keaton go into his Batman voice during that during that entire car ride during that entire car scene. Good shit. I like it a lot. No complaints. Uh, the actors who play who play members of of of, it, of the Vulture's crew, they're okay. You know, the, you get the character of the Tinkerer who's there to who pretty much is there to modify the weapons. He's fine. You got Joaquin Woodburn who takes on the role of uh, Herman Schultz, the original Shocker. It's kind of a letdown that Herman Schultz didn't get that that Joaquin Woodburn didn't get a chance to don the Shocker outfit, but he does have the shock gloves. You have an actor who is like who is like a discount Tom Hardy, who was the original Shocker. I can't remember what his name was in the movie, and I'm having a hard time remembering who the actor's name is because he's it's such a minor role; it means nothing. But the movie's best joke happens is when Toombs accidentally kills him, and he and he told he goes to Tinker, he's like, "I thought this was the anti gravity gun," and then and then Tinker's like, "No, it's that one over there." And he's like, "Oh, okay." I like that. I think that's, 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 that's like the best joke in the movie to me. That dark that dark comedy that slips in. Good stuff. I like it a lot. But yeah, the actors who play in Toons' crew, they're fine. They're just pretty much there as henchmen and people for Spider-Man to fight. So that's really all that they're there for. Just for some, just just for just to give Spider-Man something to do in the lead up to getting to Adrian Toomes. <clears throat> now in turn to this movie's action sequences, this movie's got some pretty good action sequences. Like John Watts is not an is not an action director by trade. So not all the action sequences are gonna be are gonna be all that great, but you do got some pretty decent ones. Like I like I like the stuff with Spider-Man and the Vulture. I think those are the best scenes. Uh, the scene at the ferry in Staten Island that's a really good scene where Vol where Spider-Man is trying to uh, stop an arms deal from going down. You have Michael Mondo who is playing Ma Matt Gorgon doing a deal with Vulture. Uh, I like how they established McGargan, the Scorpion. Of course, he doesn't don the costume because I don't expect him to. But at least we established him down the line. Of course, if you watch the MCU, Scorpion never came back, comes back. Even though the uh, mid credits, even though the mid credit scene teases something with that. <clears throat> but yeah, it's fun to see Michael Mondo, Nacho from Better Call Saul, play play McGargan. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't really do anything. And then like, uh, and during the deal, he om we're led to believe that he dies until he until he makes a, an appearance in the mid credit scene. But yeah, the whole but the whole purpose of the ferry scene is just to add on to Peter is just to add on to Peter's uh, overconfidence to the fact that just because he has that he can do these things that he's ready for it when he's really not because the people because the something happens uh, once um, once Tombs dons the vulture outfit during the ferry scene he kind of cracks the boat in half and Peter has to pretty much pull it all together. It's like a nice little uh, <clears throat> it's like this is like the ferry scene. And this movie is basically their version of the train scene from Spider-Man 2, where Peter has to do anything, everything in his power to stop the train. In this movie, Peter has to do everything in his power to kind of to, to keep the ferry from falling apart and everyone dying. Of course, this is where Iron Man comes in to save, to basically, you know, bail Peter out. And this is what leads to a really cool scene where Peter, where pretty much, uh, where pretty much Stark just balls out Peter for just being a kid who is not ready for the, who's not ready for what, for, who's not ready for the power that he possesses. <clears throat> and I like that stuff. You know, again, that's like, that's, that's, that's Tony Stark acting like a hardened dad talking to his son who, who he's told time and time again to like not do the things he does. 
but he doesn't listen. So now Tony Stark's got to be that discipline, disciplinary father to pretty much put his son in check. I like that stuff. It's good stuff. Like, it really is good stuff, and it adds a lot to Peter's character because his high-tech suit gets taken away from him, and now he has to use the makeshift home suit that he has. And this further establishes that Peter... And this further establishes the fact that, you know, that Spider-Man is, uh, is not this superhero that goes in, that does these wacky cosmic adventures. He's the superhero who tries to keep his city, who tries, tries to keep his town safe, who's trying to keep his neighborhood safe. And by him going back to his... And so by Peter reverting back to the whole makeshift suit, it, it furthers the point of to that Tony Stark was trying, to, was trying to tell Peter during the scene, during the, uh, during the confrontation on the rooftop, is that... The suit doesn't make the man, the man makes the suit. And this is what encourages Peter to be like, listen, I don't need to have a high-tech suit to be Spider-Man. I just need to have the determination and the willpower to be Spider-Man. And this is what leads to a really fun third act fight scene with him and the Vulture, where Vulture is trying to steal from Stark from Tony Stark because it was Tony Stark who funded damage control that pretty much cost Adrian Toomes and his crew their job as a scavenger, as a sca as scavengers. <clears throat> And, and <clears throat> as scavengers so yeah all that leads to a night to a good third act to a good third act fight sequence which ends on Coney Island which I enjoyed which I enjoyed immensely it's a nice fist fight between between the vulture and Peter Park between the vulture and Spider-Man good stuff uh so yeah now that I covered all of that let me touch on some negatives before I wrap this review around uh some of the negatives that I had uh the entire third act it's revealed during the third act. It's revealed that Liz is act that Adrian is actually Liz's dad, and they don't do anything to really do it to really like heighten the stakes with that with that revelation. Um, you would think that okay, we just got the, we just found out that Liz that Liz's dad is it was the villain the whole time. How is Liz going to react to this? And how is Liz going to react that Peter Spider Man? How is she going to play a role in the climax? Nothing. It's it's it, it's said then forgotten about, and a movie movie goes on. A letdown. <laughs> You could have done so much. You could have done so much and heightened the stakes so much. Instead, it, you just set it up, and you don't pay it off. What was the point? Of, what was the point of even keeping it a revelation? If you're gonna do that, you might as well have established early on in the movie that Adrian Toomes was Liz's dad, and just and not even do a twist because you didn't do anything creative with it. You just set it up and didn't pay it off. I mean, yes, it leads to one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie with the conversation in the car, but that's not enough. Like, what happens afterwards? And that's what matters the most. Um, I think a lot of Adrian, I think a lot of Toons' crew is kind of underutilized in this movie, particularly that of Bucking Woodburn, who takes on the role of the Shocker. Like Shocker has a couple of cool, has a couple of fight scenes here and there, but he never dons the suit. And I would have had him don the suit and have he and Vulture take down, Sp take on Spider-Man at Coney Island. I think that could have made for a cool handicap match, <clears throat> but we don't get that. Uh, Another another as another thing that I think was another aspect that I think was wasted in this movie is uh, is is MJ. Uh, so basically, Zend <clears throat> basically uh, Zendaya's version of MJ. She's just MJ in name only. She doesn't have any of the characteristics of MJ. And the movie make and the movie treats her reveal as MJ as like this big thing. It's really not. You could have easily called herself. You could have easily had Zendaya be the MCU version of Mary Jane and go on from there. And the fact that she's mean to Peter is because that she secretly likes him. I didn't need. Uh, I didn't need to wait to the end of the movie to to get that. It, it kind of like it kind of said it. And now I'm just scratching. Now I'm just waiting for you to just make it official because you keep tiptoeing around it when when I already when I already uh, when most of your audience has already put two and two together. It's kind of just forced drama at that point. And you have Tony Revel and you have Tony Revelary's version of Flash, who is not all that great. He's kind of just stock and generic and boring. He doesn't have the intimidation of Joe Magliano, or that just or that or that jock bully as from the one from Amazing Spider-Man. He's just like that pretender who tries to act tough, but is really not that tough. Maybe it's a typical high school student for this movie's universe. I would have made Flash a little bit more of a bully to Peter instead of this like instead of like this guy who just wants to clown him all the time. <clears throat> And then you have John Watts when he's directing Spider-Man, just doing Spider-Man things like contorting his body and web-slinging. A lot of the web-slinging in this movie, there's no dynamics to them, which is kind of a shame because you could, you could have gotten real creative with it. 
the one thing that the Raimi trilogies did really well is that Sam Raimi was a visual artist and he really like exploited Spider-Man as a character when he's doing his when he's do doing Spider-Man things. The same thing with Mark Webb in the in the Amazing Spider-Man movies also. They knew how to shoot Spider-Man like just, you know, swinging around New York City and, and being creative with it, with the way he would he would do that and using web shooters and stuff like that. We didn't get a lot of that in this movie. Which is a shame because you could you could have gotten you could done you could been able to do so much with that, <clears throat> uh, and and you also you have uh, Matt Gargan Scorpion play on Michael Mondo he's kind of wasted in this movie he doesn't really do anything except nearly die but then you get to the mid credit scene and it's revealed that he's still alive and he's in jail with Tombs they have a conversation and the movie kind of sort of teams of the, of the Scorpion and Vulture teaming up to take down Spider Man down the line which of course has to this as of right now has not happened yet. But the best ending is basically uh, is basically Tony and Peter making amends. Tony wanted to induct Peter to the Avengers. Peter saying no, saying he wants to be a neighborhood Spider-Man, and Tony be and Tony actually hearing what he wanted to hear Peter Parker say, which is focus on being uh, focus on being you and not and don't focus on trying to be part of a team. Focus on being you first. I like that stuff. It ha it, it 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 makes the whole relationship come full circle. And I, of course, I like the ending of Aunt May finding out that Peter Park, that Peter is Spider-Man. That leads to some cool stuff. That that leads to some good stuff with No Way Home and far, with Far From Home and No Way Home. So, with all that being said, I'm going to give Spider-Man Homecoming a solid 7.5 out of 10. I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I do like it a lot. It ain't the greatest Spider-Man movie ever made, but it's a fun Spider-Man movie and a worthy addition to the MCU. So, yeah. 7.5 out of 10 for Spider-Man Homecoming. Let me know your thoughts in the comment sections down below. Like the video and subscribe. And I'll check you back next time for more.